So tell us a little bit about the efficacy and the results that you saw in those studies. Yeah. Lertractin particularly it has been uh, the most effective small molecule uh, kinase inhibitor I've, I've ever seen. I'm, you know, I've done a lot of clinical phase one trials. Um, the approval uh, <coughs> um, uh, data showed a 75% uh, response rate. I know that about a 20% complete response rate in metastatic solid tumor, which you know, I, you know, Marsha, you and I have never seen before <laughs> in any class of drugs. Um, and what the data that we presented, both in the adults and I think what um, we've shown is, is that this, this response rate continues even after we've enrolled um, uh, in the adult population was an additional, you know, 83 patients. Um, and then with the, I think, uh, at, at this ASCO when we presented with the pediatric, it was like 105. Mm -hmm. um, we since then have enrolled even more. And what we've, we've seen is, is that uh, this durability of response is, is maintained. Um, the actual duration of response has not been reached, um, which is incredible. And the median progression-free survival in the adult data set in the abstract that we presented today was uh, over two years, 25.6 months. And that's, that's incredible. I, you yeah. know, I rarely see that with any small molecule inhibitors, uh, let alone any drugs. And so um, the overall survival has not been reached. Mm -hmm. So um, clearly, I have patients on uh, at least lertractinib um, uh, for years. And the original patient, that phase one patient who initially uh, was identified in the phase one, still remains on study almost five years later. It's great. I actually, I've met your patient, as it oh turns my. out. And what's amazing to me about her story is the fact that her lungs were over 50% replaced by tumor. Yeah. So when you're talking about complete responses in these patients, yeah. it really is nothing short of remarkable. Yeah, well, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, um, were there any differences that were observed between tumor types then? Yeah. So she obviously had a sarcoma, I believe. Yeah, the sarcoma. Um, it, if you look at the label, there uh, was some uh, responses, that uh, some uh, tumor types that had lower response rate. For example, colorectal had a lower response rate. But the numbers were small. Uh, I think uh, in the 55 patient data set, uh, there was uh, four patients, so um, and and so it's not clear right now what the um, uh, exact uh, numbers across all histologies. But overall, if you took the f overall population, it seems like uh, almost everybody who has an antrac fusion seems to have some kind of response. Were there differences then also between patients who had been previously treated on chemotherapy versus people who are getting it? Not that in the first not line? that we know of. Not that we uh, have, uh, you know, uh, as you know, most patients who have a significant refractory chemofractory disease tend to oftentimes uh, not be responsive to targeted therapies or new therapies. To date, um, I, I, it did not seem to make a difference. Responses with lyrotrectinib uh, appeared to be independent of tumor type. Uh, in fact, they seem to be pretty consistent across the board, regardless of tumor type. And uh, responses were observed, regardless of the, the number of prior regimens uh, that were administered to the patients. And that is uh, a common theme in the world of personalized therapy or precision medicine, where we are using very specific agents against very specific targets. Uh, prior history, to some extent, may influence outcome, but not to the extent that we've traditionally seen with systemic uh, cytotoxics. Recently, uh, Alex Drillon has been one of the key figures in the development of NTRAC inhibitors, updated uh, the uh, uh, non-small cell component of uh, the larotractinib story. There were only four patients uh, with non-small cell in the original New England Journal paper. That's now expanded to 11. Uh, again, relatively small numbers, but the response rates are holding up uh, in seven uh, individuals with measurable tumor. Four had partial responses to stable disease and uh, one with uh, um, questionable disease progression. Uh, no major surprises with respect to toxicity. Still see some fatigue and constipation, some edema, uh, some uh, fluid retention. The uh, responses are quite durable. Uh, 
about 70% or so, or, um, and this is not just responses, but stable disease, 70% of those enrolled uh, are maintaining uh, freedom from progression at at least a year. So it's nice to have a bit more data, uh, considering the original New England Journal paper included all of four patients. Uh, and uh, I suspect as time goes on, we'll see a lot more data um, th that'll uh, further enrich our uh, uh, understanding of uh, uh, Larotrectinib's role, at least in non-small cell. The, at this year's ASCO, uh, Hong uh, and colleagues updated the, the results of the, the original Larotrectinib study, um, specifically focusing on adults with a variety of malignancies, including salivary gland tumors, lung cancer, GBM, thyroid carcinoma. And the response rates continued to hold up in the 70, 75 percent range. Again, no major surprises when it comes to uh, uh, toxicities. Uh, we're still seeing some uh, constipation and edema and fatigue, uh, but nothing that's, uh, dif that's extra uh, tough to manage or difficult to um, manage. Median follow-up, of course, is a bit more mature, roughly a year and a half. Um, the median durations of response have not been reached yet. So we're uh, speaking of a uh, drug that's activity level is, appears to be on par with electinib uh, and brigatinib's activity in ALK positive disease and probably equal or surpassing that seen with even the more uh, modern EGFR inhibitors, third generation agents like uh, osimertinib. This is very exciting.